First off, uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining the GRSS webinar hosted this time by uh, the Earth Science Informatics Techn Technical Committee. Uh, my name is Manil Maske and I work for NASA and also co-chair the uh, technical committee here. And today I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ram Rahul Ramachandran, who is a senior research scientist at uh, NASA and also manages the project called IMPACT, which I believe he will talk about. Um, Rahul was also a former co-chair of the ESI Technical Committee. And today he's going to talk about open science and uh, uh, from the earth science data systems perspective. A little bit of background, Rahul's research cent uh, uh, centers on uh, earth science informatics, data science, and uh, most notably applying these uh, computational techniques uh, to solve processing, discovering, uh, and analysis of uh, earth science data information. Um, Rahul has a long list of achievements, but uh, most notable ones include the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2009 and the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal in 2018. Uh, I don't know, Rahul, do you want to be interrupted while you're talking or we should wait for the questions at the end, your call? Um, I think maybe at the end would be better. Okay. All right, then the floor is yours. We'll, I will monitor the chat for questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me see if uh, I'll try sharing my screen again. So, uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I hope uh, all of you are doing well uh, in these trying times. And thank you so much for attending this webinar. Uh, the presentation of my title is, you know, role of uh, data systems to enable open science. Uh, the overall context of the presentation is to give you, you know, you know how we are moving away from just open data to open science. Um, I have added some slides at the end that talk about uh, the new initiative that will be launched soon. Uh, so here's the outline of my presentation. Um, First, I'll give you a context. Um, as Manil mentioned, you know, uh, I primarily work in data system side. Uh, so I'll give a context about NASA's Earth Science Data Systems. I hope most of you know and have, have access to uh, data from our systems. Uh, then talk a little bit more in depth about our shifting focus from open data to open science, uh, give an overview in terms of what are the different definitions of open science areas of active efforts in open science and the challenges uh, that are faced uh, all through a lens of data systems. Uh, that's, you know, uh, since our, my, my anchor is on the data system side. Um, also given a, an exemplar effort uh, called MAP that implements a lot of these open science principles um, and one slide on how you as an individual can be an advocate of open science, how you can adopt these principles and practices in your science process. And like I mentioned, uh, towards the end, I'll give you a sneak peek at NASA's new initiative called Open Source Science uh, that builds on all these principles and practices and expands it even further, actually. So as most of you may know, uh, you know, NASA has one of the largest Earth observation uh, data holdings. Uh, the data holdings cover a wide range of thematic areas, uh, going from all the way land to human dimensions. Uh, and they support research to, uh, to understand Earth as a complete system. Uh, the data that we have in our holding not only comes from space bond assets, but also from a gamut of other assets such as airborne instruments, International Space Station, uh, field campaigns, and from other international partners. So there's a wide variety uh, of data that we have uh, that makes it you know, complicated to use uh, and it uh, serves a wide science community all over the globe. So just a quick overview on the Earth Science Data Systems Program. This is run out of headquarters. Uh, it is responsible for managing all the data set, uh, whether it's satellite, airborne, uh, 
or field data uh, throughout the data life cycle. And uh, the process that is used is a very systematic engineered process for data stewardship. The figure on the left shows the concept of a data life cycle, um, you know, going from a mission to a standard pro product generation, to ingest and storage, the generation of the key documentation, uh, enabling discoverability, usability, uh, things for distribution and access, user support and full archive for data, data preservation. So as you can see, it's uh, the life cycle has many steps and each step then has different elements in it that have to be uh, worked through. Um, the program is also responsible for processing instrument and reprocessing instrument data to create this high quality long-term science data records that can be used by the science community. The other element of the program is that it develops and provides uh, data system capabilities that is designed to support science investigations and interdisciplinary research. So the data system in this figure on the left is the blue ribbon. Uh, so the data system sits on top of the data life cycle and it supports the research life cycle that individual researchers you know, go through in terms of you know, defining their research goals, finding the data, accessing the data, doing their analysis and then producing uh, their publications. Uh, interoperability and evolution of the data system is core tenants within the program. And one major thing is the policy of open data, uh, which was, you know, uh, uh, has, which has been established right from the beginning. And I will talk a little bit more about it later because I think that that's been the key legacy of the program. So moving from uh, you know, the conceptual data life cycle and research life cycle uh, uh, diagrams, this is a very high level view of the system and the data flow. So this basically shows you know, you have your feeds coming in from different assets. Uh, they go through a rigorous process of, you know, capture and cleaning, processing, archiving, and then uh, uh, services that are provided along with distribution to uh, different com communities of users that we have all over the world, whether it's research applications or the universities and uh, other educational entities. The, obviously, this is a very high level uh, view the actual system is much more complicated. The system is uh, federated. Uh, you have the data being produced by SIPs, uh, which are these oval boxes. SIPs uh, stands for Science Investigator Led Processing Systems. Uh, they are responsible for generating the science quality data, uh, which is then distributed and archived by the DACs, which are the data centers. Uh, and both the SIPs and the DACs are selected based on the expertise, the science expertise in that specific domain. Um, so one down, downside of it is that you can see that the system is, you know, the whole overall system, federated system is geographically dispersed. Uh, the data gets dispersed. So there are ways, you know, hopefully in the future, we can co-locate all the data to enable uh, new kinds of science. To give you some numbers to, uh, for context uh, for the program, this is not uh, updated. These are 2019 numbers. Uh, the archive has about 30, 35 petabytes. It's projected to grow to 250 petabytes within the next five years uh, with the launch of new high data rate uh, emissions uh, like SWOT and NISAR. Uh, the system delivered close to 2 billion files to 3 million science users across the world. So there are, and there are about half a billion files in the science repository. So we are talking about a large uh, data system that supports a large user community, a diverse user community from all over the world. So going back to, to my point uh, about the uh, free and open data, when the program was initiated uh, in 1994, um, you know, the, this open policy was enacted uh, since then. 
And I think the policy has been a pathfinder, you know, particularly for other organizations, and it has supported advances in research uh, for over the last 25 years. So I think that has been a great legacy for the program in terms of uh, NASA data being available to everyone around the world uh, since the inception. So looking ahead, you know, we want to move from open data to adoption of open science. And um, this part of the presentation, I will basically give you an overview of open science through the lens of data systems again. Uh, and the material from this presentation actually comes from a paper we have published this year um, that is uh, uh, through AGU's uh, Earth's Earth and Space Science Journal. So there's a link there if you're interested in lead, uh, learning more about the details of it. Um, please go, go and refer to that paper. So uh, if you do not know, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what is open science, uh, what's happening in open science, um, and then talk about you know, the new uh, NASA effort that will uh, be unveiled uh, uh, soon. So science is both a noun and a verb in a sense that science is both a body of knowledge as well as a systematic method of uh, knowing something. Um, the, there are many open science definitions if you start uh, researching. Um, some of them are too broad, some of them are too narrow. Uh, the narrow ones focus on accessibility to scientific knowledge. Uh, the broad ones tend to focus, you know, tend, tend to be, uh, as, as an example here, is any activity that creates a knowledge is considered open science. Um, so when we were uh, doing the literature survey for our paper, we were not too happy. We wanted something more precise, at least based on our context where, where we come from. So we came up with this definition in, in this paper. And there were four components in this definition that we thought were important. Uh, we wanted uh, to be part of the definition. First, yes, open science is a, a new culture of collaboration. Um, it, we feel it's definitely enabled by technology um, and that allows sharing of all research uh, artifacts, whether it's data, information, knowledge, uh, with the goal of accelerating scientific uh, research and understanding. So that's our definition uh, that, that we've uh, put forth in the paper. So before I dive deeper into open science, um, I do want to make a distinction between open science and reproducible science because they tend to be used interchangeably. You know, we see reproducible science as a subset of open science. Um, a lot of open science principles are needed for reproducible science, obviously having access to the code and having access to the data and the methodology. So there are three primary drivers that we feel are uh, you know, pushing this whole expansion of open science. Um, the first one is technology, uh, rapid advances in technology have made the process of doing science and sharing results much more efficient, much more easier. Um, you know, cloud, in ability to you know, post things on social media, blogs, all those uh, things have contributed to this movement. The second area is the data, the whole notion of big data, where you have really large volumes of data, the velocity of data, a variety of data that we're dealing with is really large and heterogeneous. Um, and it's disrupting existing data systems as well as the traditional means of doing analysis. What that means is, you know, trying to write code and do analysis at scale. You are limited uh, by resources, uh, tooling, uh, like, you know, uh, and uh, software. Uh, the third, third aspect is Oops, sorry. The third aspect here is the whole notion of team science. Uh, you know, we find that there is a rise in number of papers with multiple authors uh, as, you know, teams are tackling more complicated problems or trying to deal with a larger variety of data. You need a larger team, a collaborative team 
of researchers that bring a different set of expertise to solve the problem. So if you look at the, uh, the effort that's going in open science, that it's focused on three primary areas. Uh, the first one is accessibility to science, uh, both as science as a way of thinking and science as a body of knowledge. The other effort has been focused on how do you make the research processes and knowledge sharing more efficient. And the two areas that we look at here is the notion of having a cyber infrastructure to support science, that is having a platform with the tooling and the data that allows you to do the science. And the other aspect here is collaborations. How do you enable collaborations within the science workflow itself? Um, the third area is understanding scientific impact. Like how do you measure the, the impact of science, science that is being done? So looking at each one of these in a little bit more depth. Um, so the first area is looking at accessibility to science, um, science as a way of thinking, as a disciplined way of thinking and conducting research. So there are two elements here. The first one is, you know, how do you make the scientific process accessible by allowing participation in different parts of the process? An example here are citizen science efforts that range from data gathering all the way to analysis. The other element here is looking at how do you uh, make science results understandable uh, by the broader public. Uh, the examples here are science blogs that have been written for the public at a level without any jargon in it so that it's easily understood. The second area in accessibility is, you know, looking at science as a body of knowledge. So we will first start with data. For us, everything starts with data. And there have been a lot of efforts looking at open data policies. Uh, and the push is for a much more broader adoption of open data policy as a principle. And that is needed. And the reason is, you know, you if it prevents duplication of collection of data across organizations, it frees those free the resources for those organizations to go collect a more diverse uh, kinds of data. Uh, we know that it increases data use and reuse. Uh, Landsat data that most of us have used is a poster child for this in terms of the metrics before and after it was made open. And finally, the ability to augment existing data from other, other sources to provide a more comprehensive uh, record of observations. And a really good example for this is a new data product that we uh, recently uh, released called uh, HLS. It's Harmonized Landsat Sentinel Data. It is only possible because of you know, the data exchange agreement we have with the NASA, ESA, and our ability to get the Landsat data through from USGS. I will talk a little bit more about this because it shows you know, things you can do because we have these data agreements and we have access uh, uh, to uh, data from different sensors that can be used and combined. So this is, as I mentioned, this, this is the HLS uh, uh, data product uh, that is available now. The video on the left is kind of an interesting to see, you know, how combining the two Landsat and Sentinel increases your footprint. So this data product uses Landsat Landsat and Sentinel-2 data to produce this seamless 30-meter uh, product that can be used interchangeably. And by combining data from these two, two sensors, it reduces the revisit time from 16 days down to two to four days. So this is a really nice example of, you know, if data is openly available from different organizations that kind of need things you can uh, do with it. One second. All right. Um, so for accessibility to science, looking at software, uh, I think uh, we know uh, there are, have been efforts to promote open source software policies. Uh, the goal for these policies are to, oops, encourage software reuse, uh, which you know, we know that lowers duplication of effort I think the uh, adoption 
of these open source by a larger community and shows that the code base is maintained longer. Uh, it allows teams actually to work across uh, organizations and have a much broader collaboration rather than just their uh, preferred uh, groups of people. And again, uh, you know, open code ensures reproducibility and transparency. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why this is pushed. Uh, this is being pushed um, uh, as one of the, the key principles. The third component uh, uh, in terms of accessibility to science uh, is the access to literature. So a lot of effort has been made to move towards open access literature. You have gold access journals that you know, are open access. Uh, there are green open access journals. These are journals that allow your authors to self-publish. Uh, that means you can place your uh, your paper in any one of the self archiving uh, locations like X Archive X, and there are journals that allow hybrid models where a paper within a journal can be made open um, if the article cost is borne by the the author itself. The second area within the open science where a lot of effort is being focused on is this notion of how do you make uh, the research processes and knowledge sharing more efficient. And as I mentioned, cyber infrastructure is one area. Uh, uh, the, it is an essential component in you know, a cyber infrastructure here means the platform, uh, the tooling, uh, which means the services, the software, as well as the data that allows researchers to do uh, research at scale. Uh, this frees up researchers from the resource limitations that they may have of storage, compute, um, or the, uh, the obstacles they may face in terms of installing complex software. And it also abstracts away some of the data management, data wrangling complexity that may be needed uh, with dealing with large volumes and variety of, variety of data. The second uh, element in this area, <coughs> excuse me, focuses on collaborations. So one area are tools that allow researchers to form social networks and share papers. Uh, you, know, you know, ResearchGate and Mendeley are really good examples of that. The other area ties back to the platforms and the tools to allow sharing of all research objects, not just the papers at the end. So how do you enable collaboration with data, code, workflows, so these platforms need to support sharing during actionable research and not just provide Dropbox or a Google Drive type uh, capability. And I'll show a feature in one, the map example of the capability, the collaboration that you can enable now with the new cap uh, technology that's available. The, the third and the final area of focus of uh, effort in open science focuses on understanding scientific impact. So this area is actually looking at, you know, on quantitative measures and assessing impact that go beyond just using standard uh, literature based uh, measures such as X scores. And the argument here is that with the advent of electronic publishing, as well as uh, digital workflows, uh, we can now m measure both the sharing and the use of these artifacts. So there's a whole area of altmetrics that was established in 2010 that is looking at coming up with a new quantitative scores uh, that can be used. So in, in terms of, you know, uh, the adoption of these open science concepts and, and principles are not without challenges. Um, I'm listing here only a few, uh, you know, if you want to see a more comprehensive list, please refer to the paper. Um, so some of the common challenges here are, you know, sharing, in this case, we are looking at data can allow misuse, you know, you can have data if you don't have the proper documentation with it to be used incorrectly. Uh, one thing we have noticed is, you know, copying of data without proper data stewardship practices can cause problems where data is copied from one platform to the other uh, and things are not kept in sync, you may have version updates if the previous version has some issues. So those are the things that uh, we are finding. Um, the open source process for code is confusing at best, both in terms of you know which license to use and where to share your code. 
Uh, we also need to evolve our existing data systems to either serve in a you know seamless interoperable manner to different cyber infrastructures of analysis platforms uh, to facilitate analysis or evolve directly into these platforms itself. So that that's a big shift in terms of you know what the role of data systems should be. Um, and then the whole notion of acceptance and adoptions of new metrics, uh, which is not assured. So that was a high level overview of what is open science, uh, you know, different areas of open science where a lot of effort and thought has been put into. I'll show you an example of a project called MAP. This is our cyber infrastructure project. And I think uh, interesting thing about this is it actually uh, um, adopts a lot of these principles in, in the design of it itself. So uh, MAP stands for a multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform. Uh, it's, a, it's jointly developed and managed both by ESA and NASA. And the motivation uh, for this platform was that both ESA and NASA, uh, ESA with biomass mission and NASA with JEDI and NISAR are going to develop biomass products. So enabling collaborations between the science teams from the two different agencies was essential to speed up the process of the science algorithm development. So as I mentioned, MAP adopts a lot of these open science principles. MAP allows access to uh, data and code. It allows collaboration uh, in the algorithm development where the teams can jointly code together. And one of the really nice features about a map is it allows uh, researchers to scale up their workflows easily. So the map goals uh, are given here. Uh, the goal is to have uh, allow researchers to have access to airborne, spaceborne, and field data from both agencies um, to co-develop algorithms in a collaborative manner uh, to be able to calibrate and validate their algorithms using multiple sources of data, and then to be upscale uh, their processing, you know, from a small location where they've tested their algorithm out to production scale where they can run it at a, a, a global, uh, for global processing. So the figure at the bottom kind of shows this concept that you have uh, team members working on this uh, Jupyter notebook together since they have access to field data uh, from different, both the agencies, they can collaborate and to calibrate and validate and fine tune their algorithms. And once they're um, satisfied with the quality of their algorithms, then they can scale up to process for the entire holdings to create these biomass uh, products. This figure shows the uh, NASA uh, map system architecture. Uh, this is deployed in AWS and uses a lot of existing uh, NASA open source code on the uh, data system side. There are four components, major components here within the system. The first one is the ADE, which is the algorithm development environment. The other one is the data processing service the data management services, and then the analysis services. So four distinct components, um, each one providing a unique capability to the uh, uh, researcher. So the ADE provides researchers with uh, a web-based IDE, uh, a development environment and a workspace where they can co-develop algorithms by jointly coding and editing. Uh, the DPS provides the capability for a researcher to take their, uh, their notebooks and launch uh, large scale processing jobs with minimum effort. And there is a common uh, repo that is used to, uh, for code sharing. The data system for MAP uh, uses, as I mentioned, a lot of existing NASA uh, data system code to provide uh, data stewardship functionality for this platform. It has about 50 curated data sets from NASA and ESA focused on the biomass community needs. And the data have been transformed to cloud optimized formats uh, to speed up access for analysis and processing. So some results, what this you know, um, 
platform has enabled. This is showing the reduction in processing time. So it shows how MAP enables a researcher to efficiently scale up. So a single machine, if you are doing this as a researcher on your computer, on your laptop, a single granule of a, a single radar granule with the processing would take about 50, uh, more than 15 minutes. With MAP being with the, uh, the processing service where you're, uh, you can scale out, uh, you can do the whole globe, which is about 1100 files to in, in around 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes. So this is showing the capability a platform can provide in terms of reducing the time and effort for an individual researcher uh, in dealing with large vol volumes of data. The next slide shows a new biomass product that has been enabled because of uh, MAP. Uh, this product uses ISAT2 to fill in JEDI's uh, Northern Gap. So again, an example of you know, access to all the data being co-located to allow researchers to develop a completely new uh, product uh, uh, using this particular platform. So, I just have one slide um, that talks about, you know, how uh, you as an individual um, researcher can be an advocate for open science. Um, and I list some, you know, basic principles and practices that, you know, you could adopt in your own, your own uh, processes. So, you know, most of these are fairly obvious, you know, make your data available in an open repository, uh, make sure your data is not in a, a non-proprietary is in a non-proprietary standardized format. Where possible, create a DOI for your data so that people can cite it. Uh, open source your software and code. Uh, use permissive licenses as much as possible to encourage reuse. Uh, support community development of open source software. So if you're using libraries, uh, contribute back to the libraries as best as you can. Uh, publish in open access journals an open access journal is not available, then try self-publishing. Self um, engage public uh, with your work, whether it's through blogs or working on supporting citizen science projects, supporting hackathons, or sharing your results on social media. And lastly, I think uh, this is really important, give attribution to not just other people's work in, that is in journals, but also to the data that you've used to the software that you use for documentation that you use. Somebody has taken the time and effort to produce these things for you to utilize. So make sure you give them attribution so that they, they you know, it's, it's important. Um, the last section of this talk is just a quick overview of, uh, yeah, of, uh, of it's a quick preview of NASA's Open Science Initiative that will be unveiled soon, I think next week. Um, this initiative builds on all these open science principles and practices that I have presented so far. And I think it goes beyond, uh, beyond that. So why is it called open source science? I think the, it borrows from the open soft, source software uh, principles, you know, which broaden the participation in developing code. And it's applying the same analogy to the scientific process by, you know, opening and opening and expanding participation right from the beginning of the project all the way through the implementation and not just at the end. Um, I have covered, you know, the access transparency and reproducibility aspects already. Uh, but I think one neat thing about this whole initiative is this whole, whole inclusive science aspect, uh, which is trying to broaden participation from a diverse group of people and organizations. So it's looking beyond just you know, access, uh, transparency, and reproducibility. Um, there, there are, here are some implications to the uh, ESGS program itself. Uh, some of the key points here are, you know, it cements NASA's commitment to open science with the launch of this uh, initiative. Uh, the goal is to involve users throughout the data life cycle and not just at the end when the data product is being distributed. Uh, 
The goal is to make sure that data and compute are side by side to enable analysis. And the preservation will go beyond just data, but also look at documentation and software. So uh, the, this will be launched in this workshop uh, on October 14th. Um, it's a link, uh, uh, I'll post the link in the chat later. Um, you know, it's open to everyone. If you are interested, please join. And if you have questions about different policies, things like that, um, please raise it in the workshop. Uh, and I think that is my last slide. I do want to give attribution for some of the slides, you know, for the open source science slides. Uh, they come from Kevin Murphy's slide deck. The map slides come from Kalen Bugby and the map team. And the HLS slide comes from Brian Freitag. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and I'll take some questions. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, anybody, if you have a question, you can just unmute yourself or just type the question in. Um, Rahul, can you put the link to that uh, workshop you just mentioned in the chat? There's some yeah. people who are requesting that. I think there's a first question is from Nikunj. Uh, let me read that question. You mentioned co-locating data from different DACs to allow more science across domains covered by the DACs. What barriers do you see, if any, to co-locate data only virtually to a single DAC? So I, I don't think there will be a concept of a single DAC, but I think the uh, Nikon Jazim know NASA uh, data system, they're trying to migrate all the data holdings to a common uh, cloud platform. So for an end user perspective, it will appear as a single holding where they can go access and use the data. Uh, but the stewardship would still be managed by uh, the different groups because they have the science expertise uh, to do that. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Oh, uh, Rahul, uh, can you hear me? Actually, I had a little follow up to that. Um, sure. <laughs> Yes, yeah, yeah, thanks again for the talk. Really, really good stuff. Um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking, though, you know, you can imagine there, since NASA already has its significant holdings, you can imagine not wanting to bother migrating those to cloud, maybe only the newer ones, but still giving the user the feeling that there's just one system and essentially automatically then go to NASA's holdings for some of the older stuff and then the cloud for some of the newer stuff. Do you see that being possible to where we, the you know, users have no idea that there are multiple systems in multiple places? So the answer to this is slightly complicated, but I'll try to, you know, from, if you truly want to utilize the power of the new technology, in this case, it is cloud, then you need to migrate your data to the cloud and make sure that it is in a new format that enables faster access, right? That's the effort looking at in cloud optimized uh, formats like COGS or ZAR that enable you to do parallel reads. Um, so ideally, yes, you would want everything moved in a new format that enables science at scale. Now, realistically, is that possible? Probably not. I think there will be some prioritization given and maybe a hybrid model may work where some data may be on, on premise, but to an end user, it's a seamless access. So. Thanks. I'm taking the easy way out here. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> there's an ideal situation and then what realistically would be possible. Uh, I can imagine quite a difference between the two. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's uh, another question from David Smith. Is there a possibility to discover data across all of DAX from a single catalog? And where possible, is there a way to find out what's already accessible via cloud, for example, S3 buckets? Uh, good question. Yeah, Earth's data search, uh, I'll put a link here. You should be able to search. It's a, um, it's a aggregated catalog. 
that allows you to search across all the DACs. Um, let me see if you can find a link here really quickly. Search that or say that in NASA. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought there was a way to um, there was a way to find. Oh, so Kellen has answered that there is a way to filter. Uh, and see, people know more than I do. Siri Jordan Kellen. Uh, a way to filter to find which data sets are currently on S3. Okay, let's move on to the next question is by Amy. How is or should NASA's process for funding research and technology development adapt to its focus on supporting open science and collaborative cross-functional items of teams? Sorry. Ooh, good question, Amy. I think uh, you need to ask that question in the workshop next Thursday. I think that's exactly kind of the questions they need to think about to answer. And I, I don't have an answer for, for you, Amy. So um, maybe I can chime in here a little bit. We, uh, the data system program has a competitive uh, solicitation called ACCESS. And we've been looking into, and, and one of the acronym that C stands for is collaborative. Um, and we have had the focus of uh, developing a requirement, putting a requirement of openness into everything we fund. So that's already part of it. Uh, but the open science aspect, there will be, I think, uh, it will be more suitable to ask during the workshop. That's that's what I, I would say. Yeah. So uh, I do not know, Manal, whether if the criteria for when you are for the reviewers is looking at uh, it's openly accessible and that whether the team are you know, adopting those principles or not. And if, if it's not there in the review criteria, I think it would be really nice if it got added to it. Yes. Good question, Amy. Uh, question from Julian. Is registration login different for citizen scientists or an undergraduate with a side project? I'm not sure I understand the question. Hopefully I don't Dave think so. I, th I think there's just a common login to access the data and oh. it is just for metrics. Uh, there is no restrictions on the data itself, Julian. Okay, next question is from Nanda Kumar. How could the variability in software apps for doing the same function be handled? The ideal answer is, uh, you know, it's good to have variety of software, you know, uh, choices of doing the same thing, the software that provides you the same thing. But ideally you want, if, if it's too many, then it's complicated. Ideally you want it to congeal to a few that are used by the community so that they could be supported long-term uh, in a more sustainable manner. Uh, but that convergence has to happen more organically. I think it cannot be forced. Uh, at least that's my, my, my perspective as an individual scientist. Okay. David has a question. Does the team have a Git repo or other good way for others to replicate the cloud compute environment, for example, CDK, Terraform, cloud formation scripts, Docker files, et cetera? I think there is. Uh, that's a good question, David. I need to double check whether it's open or not. Uh, I think that's, that's a really good question. Maybe Amy can answer that. We have. Oh uh, yeah, I was I was wondering which team are we referring to? And are you saying NASA Impact or just? I think NASA in general. I think does uh, is just yeah. Like that's open. So NASA, I mean Na the GitHub slash NASA organization definitely is like open source, and you can see a bunch of things there. I mean, I will say that in also NASA Cumulus, which is obviously doing all the data migration to the AWS cloud, is open source. Um, and they have really good documentation about how to, you know, deploy your own instance of Cumulus and use it. 
um, you know, this reminds me, Manil, of what we've been talking about, which is open sourcing more cumulus workflows from projects like the map. Um, and that's something that we're working on. Uh, so we can definitely, we're already planning on putting links to those example cumulus workflows for generating cloud optimized geotiffs um, and making those accessible sort of through the cumulus documentation. So yeah, I hope that helps. Thank you. And there are several notes uh, from Shell, uh, Kalen, et cetera, et cetera. Please check the chat. Uh, I can't keep up here. Um, I see a new question there. What about formal software, code, and data quality certification? Um, so I, Nintuko, I can't answer about the software, but you know, the for data, that's one thing that we grapple with is you know data authenticity, right? So right now, the way you know, uh, where you verify authenticated data is going to the source, right? If you go get data from NASA systems, you know you're getting the latest version that has been blessed by the science processes, the science teams. Uh, if you try to get that same data um, from somewhere else, then you do not have that guarantee because you do not know. Uh, that's what I was mentioning, one of the challenges have, that happen when you're trying to, uh, you know, cop when copies are made on different platforms, uh, you cannot verify whether the version that you're getting is the latest version, whether that's been degraded. Um, so for data, that's the way you go about doing it. Uh, you know, we go to the authenticated source, uh, then you can go get the standard checksums um, and validate that nothing has been corrupted or modified. Software is a tricky question. I think uh, this is where, you know, um, you may have to look at, you know, how many people have adopted a particular code, how many of the communities, how many people within the community are behind it. Um, you know, those may be the ways to look at uh, the quality of the, the software. I do not know if there's a, any thought given to a way of certifying um, software, unless it's a science algorithm. Uh, if it's a formal science algorithm that has been used to generate a product, that goes through a review uh, with the hope that that would be also documented uh, in, as an, it's an official document called ATBD and uh, in the future uh, with the corresponding publication with the code attached to it. Rahul, I have a question since this is a GRSS webinar. Mm -hmm. how, can, how can a professional society like IEEE, GRSS uh, be part of this initiative? So I think I see Shell on the line. I do not want to put her uh, on the spot here. So there is a big effort to um, to um, make 20, 2024 year of open science. 2023, I believe. 2023, year of open science. I got a year, uh, <laughs> one year off. Um, and I think it, it's, the planning of that has just started out. And I think the team has reached out to organizations like AGU and AMS. And I think IEEE GRSS would be a great, uh, another organization that could participate in it by promoting this no the notion of open science, the principles and practices so that the community that is vibrant within our GRSS is aware of it. Uh, can participate in it. And, you know, hopefully over the years, these things will become a norm in terms of the culture of collaboration and sharing. So Shell has posted a, a link to that effort. Yeah, Rahul, if it's, if it's okay, I'll just say uh, one question quick thing. I really appreciate the call out. So NASA is announcing a new initiative at the workshop next week on October 14th. There's been a link to it put in the chat. And yes, we're very interested in working with other groups. Uh, with this year of open science in 2023, the idea is to really try and support 
the scientific community to move towards open science and provide resources to do so. So if you're interested, you can, you can attend the October 14th workshop. Uh, there's our website, well, our initial GitHub repo. And so feel free to reach out, uh, raise an issue or start a discussion there. Thank you. And I think maybe, shall we, we need to connect you with the ATCOM in uh, GRSS. Uh, I think that would be the, the connection that needs to be made. Yes, uh, I think uh, conversation has already started. Uh, Kevin um, did an interview with the GRSS and it it will be out soon, I think. Um, but yeah, I think that'll be good. I think there are plans to do summer schools and upcoming IGARs leading up to the TOPS activities. So stay tuned. Um, yeah, we need a link for that <laughs> workshop again. We posted here. Yeah, you do. Did I miss anybody's question? If I did, please speak up. Uh, we're running top of the hour now, so maybe one more question. Looks like we didn't miss any questions. Maybe I'll ask uh, the last question then. Uh, so, are there any efforts in terms of? training aspect of how to do open science for people uh, who may not already know. I think this is a good start, but in terms of hands-on mm -hmm. training. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm hoping that the stops activity um, that Shell mentioned and is leading would touch some parts of it, right? Okay, so there are two parts of open science, right? One is just the principles and practices. And then there is the other part of it in terms of within the practices, uh, you need a little bit more training uh, in terms of, you know, creating uh, quality science code, uh, using some of these tools uh, to have that adopt practices from software development, right? So it's two part. One is just these, you know, principles that need to be promulgated and promoted and, you know, adopted. The other part is some of these actual uh, processes that need to be modified or changed or learned. So uh, I, I do not know if there's a um, specific training on that that has been thought through. I think maybe yeah, this may come out of the stops effort that uh, Shell uh, is, you know, leading. Well, thank you, Rahul. Um, I think uh, Shell, there's a comment for you from Peng about her effort in FAIR and connecting with you. Uh, do check the chat. So with that, I would like to thank everybody for joining and having in, uh, these uh, rich discussions. Special thanks to Rahul and other who uh, gave uh, provided answers to community questions. Um, and with that, I hope that all of you will consider participating in uh, NASA's